Hello, good evening. Welcome to Business Live with me, Charles Aite. Tonight, we hear the story of Ghana's first female engineer to head the Federation of African Engineering Organizations. As she says, there is nothing as a male-dominated field at work. She comes up shortly in an exclusive interview that she granted us shortly after this, this particular break. Do stay with us. Hello and welcome. The past president of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, Engineer Kale Nbushtet, of course, has been appointed as the fifth president of the Federation of African Engineering Organizations. I met her at her office at the Ghana Institution of Engineering, where we got at close and personal about her life, career, and contributions to Ghana's economic development. Here's more. So, Engineer uh, Dr. Bush, Dick, we're so grateful that you joined us in this program. Thank and I believe my congratulations are in order. You have been the first Ghanaian, as well as the first woman, to be appointed, you know, the head of the, uh, the Federation of African Engineering Organizations. Your appointment comes at an uncertain time. We're talking of COVID-19. What exactly do you bring on board? Um, let me say that COVID-19 has exposed a lot of difficulties um, mm. that we have in the way we do our things. But it's also brought in a lot of opportunities. Um, as an engineer, uh, my main skill, which is what every good engineer has, is the ability to solve complex problems. Exactly. And this can't get any more complex than it is at the moment, mm. solving uh, the kinds of problems that this COVID has exposed. I believe I bring on board an ability to solve such problems and many years of experience in working with different people, um, leading teams and getting things done. The kinds of uh, things that we need to consider in solving a problem like this are not your typical engineering problem okay. where you know you know, the exact things, you are dealing with exact things, but you are dealing with people, you are dealing with uh, governments, you are dealing with different countries, and so on. One of the things that COVID exposed was the fact that if you were in a situation where all your country's borders were closed, no goods coming in, no services coming in, can you survive? Mm. So it made us realize that we need to be far more self-reliant than we are now, which means we need to encourage our own people to be able to produce the kinds of things that we need to survive. Hmm. If we need equipment, we should be able to produce it ourselves. It means a whole lot of things, like we need to encourage innovation in the country. At the moment, we haven't paid too much attention to our own people you know, innovating and producing things and so on. And when they do, it's left with them to even try and market what they've mm. done. We haven't relied on our own selves for services, like consulting services when it comes to construction of roads and bridges and buildings and so on. As soon as it's big, the tendency is for governments to fall on outsiders to mm. do that. And I think that COVID has exposed the errors in this kind of uh, thinking. And we need to make sure that we can be self-reliant as countries within Africa and you know, pool our resources together and be able to do things ourselves. Mm. I'll come back to the issue about innovation and government support. But during your investiture speech, you made it clear that we need engineering to at least attain uh, SDGs, not just in Ghana, but across Africa. I want to read sections of uh, your statement to say that a closer look at some of uh, other goals will show that engineering inputs are also required to achieve them. For example, goal three, good health and well-being. Goal four, quality education will require infrastructure you know, and equipment that are the purview of engineering practitioners. Mm -hmm. Well, COVID-19, in your words, has exposed the inefficiency of infrastructure in these two areas. So, I mean, time in and time out, before COVID-19, we had engineers. What did you get wrong? Um, let me say, engineers didn't get anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
I shall not say who got it wrong. Sure. But um, I do not believe that it's what um, it's something that engineers got wrong. Uh, if we take these two areas, for example, when you say education, COVID-19 made us realize that we needed better communication systems. Mm. If children were to continue in school throughout the pandemic, we needed to be able to use um, modern technology to reach them in their homes for teachers to teach them. As engineers, we've always known the potential of uh, communication links. We've always known the potential of the internet and so on. But we need governments to understand how useful they are. Everybody knows on the surface that these things are useful. But then COVID-19 made people realize that it's not just oh, a fancy thing or not just you know useful in a, this thing sense, but in a very practical sense, in a very real sense, you need it. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to communicate. And I think that this pandemic has made governments around the world understand that communication, good communication is not just some fancy thing. It is as essential as breathing good air. Mm. So th that's one of the things it has exposed. Does it also not expose the fact that the infrastructure, the, the, the design approach to most of these uh, you know, uh, sectors wasn't futuristic? Well, the, let me say, when it comes to communication like this, you needed excellent communication links, which involved mostly fiber. And you needed to have that vision, mm -hmm. first of all, to make sure that you've got the backbone that is needed to reach every part of the country. Mm. And you've got the money to do the last line to different facilities and so on. And I can tell you that that uh, idea for having a backbone has been on paper for several years. It's the implementation that has fallen a bit short. We even are in a better situation than many other countries now. I would say because of the competition that we've introduced in our telecom industry. Uh, we, we had so many companies in the telecom industry that drove the competition. We now have a few, but we still are able to drive the competition because we have more than one uh, company, yeah. this thing, doing that. So it was a good decision many years ago to privatize and get in private companies and so on. And we would have to look at what we can do to make sure that we're reaching every single uh, area of the country. All right. Engineer, let's now talk about the Continental Future Agreement area because we're looking at a market value of 3.5 trillion mm -hmm. US dollars annually. Well, you have also posited that, I mean, the Federation is going to play a key role in the harmonization of standards to ensure that there is a level playing field. How are you going to improve upon your presence in this, in this, in this regard? Okay, um, with this African uh, Free Trade Agreement, everything is fine on paper to say, oh, from January 1st, 2021, we have this agreement, you can now trade all over Africa. But when it comes to engineering services, engineering products and so on, you now have to think about the standards. Do we have uniform standards Do across the continent? And we don't in several areas. So you may be producing um, sockets, for example, in Ghana, you can't send them to South Africa because they use a different type of socket there. So there are all these little things that need to be sorted out. And I said FIRE was in the best position to do this because it's the only organization on the continent that brings together all engineering organizations. FIRE is not only registering the um, individual professional engineering institutions, 
Bafaya is also registering any company within engineering practice. Mm. So mining companies, telecom companies, um, electricity uh, distributors, anything. So we are in a good position to bring these uh, entities together and discuss things and talk about harmonizing standards. In addition, we have an MOU with the AU that is to do just this kind of thing. Okay. And so the AU is looking to file to help um, do these things within the engineering sector. Mm. And that is what I hope to lead. And I will be looking at the different sectors on the continent, the way they operate, so the energy sector, the extractive mineral sector, construction sector, and so on. And we'll be forming committees getting uh, companies, those stakeholders who are involved, getting them together to start talking about harmonizing standards. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a tall order. I, I know it's not going to be something that will happen overnight because right. you have many different interests involved, but it will be done. Now, have you started talks with the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade on this particular initiative? Not yet, we haven't. So it has mainly been the AU and our dealings with the AU. But certainly we will engage after. Fortunately, they are here in Ghana, the Secretariat, exactly. and we shall certainly be paying them a visit. We do know the um, outstanding issues that are yet to be addressed and that after uh, include that of the rules of origin and even that of the harmonization of standards. Mm -hmm. Paint for us a picture, how, could, how would after look like without harmonization of standards? Without harmonization of standards, um, we will not be able to take full advantage of the agreement. Okay. So a country may have a product, but it won't be accepted in some other countries, mm. or it won't be useful in some other countries because it doesn't meet the standards in those countries. Okay. So without that harmonization, AFTA will look good on paper, but it will never realize its full potential. Mm. Engineer, you, you hold 35 years of rich experience in you know, structural engineering and every form that comes with it. And I was going through your profile and one thing that caught my attention was your input in the issues of earthquakes. And you've played a huge role in Ghana when it comes to that. But it begs the question because we are joining these keep reporting stories about how various communities are exposed. Should there be a tremor? Should there be an earthquake or whatnot? What remains the current situation of how exposed we are, if not prepared, for a potential earthquake in Ghana? Let's say that we are exposed to a potentially disastrous earthquake. Now, an earthquake will be disastrous depending on how prepared our buildings are. Mm. They are the ones that, and, and all our other infrastructure, they are the ones that, when they fail, they cause death and damage and destruction and so on. Mm. So the question, how prepared are we? I would say we are not very prepared simply because we have a lot of buildings already in existence mm. and many of which were not constructed in a manner that would ensure that they can resist a disastrous earthquake. Let me add that the knowledge of how to build to withstand earthquakes is fairly new. Um, uh, the knowledge of how to build our modern buildings, it's fairly new. It has been evolving over the years after each disastrous earthquake. We have learned what has gone wrong and we have improved. And I believe we are now at a stage where we have the knowledge to be able to build for the kind of earthquake we can ever expect in Ghana. The kinds of earthquake uh, we expect to happen in Ghana, we expect a maximum of around seven or so. And in other countries, they've had earthquakes of seven points, you know, bigger mm -hmm. than seven, yeah. and nothing has been destroyed. That's because most of the buildings have been built properly. Mm. So now, what we need to do is to ensure that all new buildings are following a proper code and 
to look at the old buildings and start to retrofit the old buildings so that they won't cause death, they won't be um, destroyed in a manner that we would make them completely useless. Mm. So, so, but that is a tall order. If you look at the number of buildings already in existence, there's a lot of work to be done. But we, we need to start from somewhere. And in other countries, they start from uh, the critical facilities, so like health facilities and educational facilities. You start from those, and you retrofit as you go along. And that's what we need to be doing. Mm. Still on that, you know, in 2019, you chaired a government committee on issues regarding um, Ghana's earthquake hazard, you know, uh, risk assessment. And I want to just use the determinants, uh, talking about Ghana's earthquake preparedness and response. What is the state of this currently? You know, throwing back to what you did in 2019. Okay. Um, there's we are a little better prepared than we were at that time. Okay. Let me say, COVID has helped in that regard because some of the recommendations that we made at the time was that we needed to have health facilities that were not just concentrated in Accra, mm. but were all over the country. And I believe because of the pandemic, that is one of the decisions that the government has made because an earthquake can strike anywhere at any time, mm. and you cannot depend on being able to rush everybody to Kolobu. So you <laughs> need to have the ambulances, you need to have those health facilities. But the other recommendations that we made, we need to know how vulnerable our buildings are. Mm. I can say offhand that, oh, maybe a lot of buildings will collapse, but sure. I don't know for sure because we have not done proper vulnerability assessments and there are ways to do that. I'm hoping that the next census will be able to give enough information on buildings in the country so that they can be analyzed for us to see this percentage of buildings. Uh, we need to be careful or buildings in this area oh please we need to retrofit immediately because they have been built in this way or this uh, manner. Mm. So there is a lot of work to be done, um, but at least there is a framework now within which that work needs to be done. Mm. Okay. Engineer Bushdead, I mean, you hold this position which gen genuinely is male dominated. Engineering is really male dominated. When I came in here and I saw these frames, I was <laughs> just overwhelmed by <laughs> the males in this picture and just you at the corner there. What does it take for a personality like yourself to hold these, this pressure? Um, let me say that for myself, I haven't thought too much about it. I just, <laughs> for me, it's, it's, um, it's never really been too different from, let me say, what I've been doing since uh, school days. Mm. So let, me, let me add that uh, I did my sixth form in Presec, which was a boys' school, and from then on, it's been males all wow. around. <laughs> I, I was the only female in the class, so I've become used to being uh, surrounded by males. And I think in general, the engineers I was working with also became used to be. They even forgot I was female. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what responsibility did it bring along, you know? Um, let me say uh, the responsibilities maybe I only sh showed themselves, you know, when other females started to come into the profession. I recall when I was working when the first other female came to join me and so on. And I realized I needed to, you know, help, mentor and so on and guide them through because they were new to it. They had different experiences from I did, mm -hmm. you know, I had when I was in school I didn't have any, you know, female mates to mm talk to or compare notes and so on. But in general, they were in a better position. There were other females around and so on. And I think that it was a little more difficult for them. So I realized that I had a mentoring role to play. And I think I did that to the best of my ability. Great. Um, 
let's 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 look at the national picture when it comes to female participation or you know female taking up roles in the engineering space how has Ghana fared? I don't think Ghana is faring too well at mm. the moment there was a time when they had uh, done quite well and gotten quite a few females in the university but now as a proportion I believe it's between 15 to 20 percent which is not good at all Worldwide, it's around 30%, which is also no good. But the surprising thing is that in some of the Asian and Arab countries, they have passed 50%. Mm. So it's doable. Mm. <laughs> you know, there are some countries that are going past 50%. Mm. So it's not something that cannot be done. Mm. Interestingly, I also wanted to ask you, whenever you sit behind your desk, what what are the kind of the fears that you know you have within this industry as a female engineer? Well, um, I'm not sure whether it's as a female engineer or as an engineer, but I think that um, sometimes our work is not appreciated enough, and that we need people need to recognize what engineers do and how important. They yeah, are. I mean. You can't, you can't do anything without engineering. In certain fields, I think it's, it's a real problem. I know in the biomedical engineering field, mm. um, the biomedical engineers I interact with, for example, do not feel that they are given enough recognition. Mm. But you must realize that these days, you cannot do, I mean, even a simple illness to be diagnosed. The doctors do not depend on years of experience exactly. like before. Look at you, take your heart and say, oh, you've got this or that. No, they need some analysis done somewhere and it's done with equipment mm. before they can come up with a decision. So it's, it's just that we are not being properly recognized and I think that should change. That is one of the things that we will try to do working with different companies and so on to give vector recognition to engineering practice. For female engineers, I know that there are still quite a few problems in many organizations and organizations like uh, those who do uh, the, the oil, um, those who work on the oil rigs and so on, exactly. they have these problems. They have these problems when they are expecting children in mm. different uh, companies and so on. And all these are things that we need to talk about. We need to work with these companies and come up with good policies that are friendly to female engineers. Mm. We cannot uh, do things the way we are doing now. It cannot be business as usual. And it's one of the things that I really intend to work on at FIO. With the companies, we will start to identify companies that FIO believes are doing the right thing. Right. And we will name them and we'll list them as preferred companies, put them in a category so that you know that these are companies you can deal with. And the kinds of things that we will look at are how do these companies treat the environment? How do these companies treat their female engineers? Because one of the things I said was we are looking for diversity. How are these companies friendly to people with disabilities? And we will look at all these things and use it to rate the companies and give, put them in a category for you to know that these are five preferred companies mm. that you can deal with. Mm. And I believe that this will go some way to helping to address the kind of situation that we have now. All right, just before I forget, I wanted you to also list, uh, list for us the priorities as you've not taken a role as president mm -hmm. of the uh, of FIRE. Okay, one of my main priorities, I actually listed four different areas in which I would be working. And one of the main priorities is in ensuring that the continent has a competent, diverse, um, group of engineering practitioners and engineering uh, industries. Okay. 
and we're grateful uh, to engineer uh, Boosted for that exclusive interview with uh, Joy Business that ends this edition of the program. My name is Charles Ayatim. Many thanks for watching.